before I hit the go button here, let me just say uh, my own initial words about uh, what you're about to see. It really is a crazy film. Um, you will enjoy it. You will learn a lot. And you will come out the back end somewhat in the same position that most of us who are, quote, in this business are in. That is, we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of thinking. And are we ready? Eh, not so much. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very interesting experience. And I have no idea how anybody other than Nellie ben who could, who could have made this. And I'm really sorry that you're not going to have the incredible pleasure of meeting her in person because she's one of the most delightful, crazy people that I know. You'll get the idea in the film because she's in it. But uh, OK, so now as a background, uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and start the presentation here. Um, planetary defense uh, you know, often is misstated as protecting the Earth from asteroid impacts. Well, in the world, you know, nothing's going to happen to the Earth. I mean, the Earth's going to be around. Asteroids are nothing compared to the Earth. But compared to life on the Earth, different issue. And what we're interested in doing here um, in planetary defense is protecting uh, life here on the planet from asteroid impacts. Well, uh, the, the question, of course, is uh, what, what is that all about? And um, so this is going to be kind of a planetary defense 101, um, just to give you a, an overview. And you'll pick up a lot of this stuff. In fact, each of the dimensions you'll pick up uh, as Nellie leads you through her film. Um, so you, you got to know what's out there. You got to have an early warning system, which tells you what's out there and what's coming at you. Um, the next thing is that you've got to be able to do something about it. And there are a couple of things that you can do, but they both come under the uh, general category of mitigation of the effect of an impact. Uh, and the third, and somewhat surprising, but again, you're going to get it in the film, uh, the surprising third and most difficult element and non-technical is the geopolitical decision-making process because somebody's got to decide to do it. And this is the whole planet. One of the things that you're going to get in this film, and you should pay attention to it, is that this is not just our problem or their problem or anybody's problem. This is our collective problem. And I'm going to say right here at the outset, I want, to keep, I want you to keep in mind the big question really that confronts us in this challenge is, is our collective survival instinct adequate for the challenge? Okay, so let's go through that then. Early warning, uh, basically, uh, you know, comprised of four things. Find them, find them again, therefore tracking them. The more you see them, the better your ability to know where they are and where they're going to be. You determine the orbits that these things are in. And let me say right here that asteroids do not orbit the Earth. Asteroids orbit the sun. They're like planets, except generally speaking, they're in elliptical orbits instead of circular ones. And therefore, they cross, some of them cross the Earth's orbit. And we'll get to that. Um, but once you've got their orbits, then uh, we can predict where they're going to be in the future. And since we can predict where the Earth is going to be and where the asteroids are going to be that we track, we can predict whether there's going to be an impact. And that's what you need in order to do something about it. Well, how do you find them? OK, you find them with telescopes, generally speaking, optical telescopes, because like planets, these things, they're like itty bitty planets, of course, millions of them, and they reflect sunlight. And so generally speaking, we find them by looking through telescopes. And that's easy with the bigger ones. But with the small ones, uh, since they're about the color of a brick of charcoal, uh, they don't reflect much sunlight. And when they get small, they got to get awful close to the Earth, even with a big telescope, uh, to reflect enough light to see them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. When they get real close, you can use radar, which is sometimes helpful, but it's not a good search uh, tool. What really helps is if we can get telescopes into space, um, and in particular, an infrared telescope. This was the one infrared telescope that's flown so far. and taken on a bit of this job. It was called uh, NEOWISE. 
uh, NEO stands for near Earth object, and forget WISE, but in any event, it's an infrared telescope. Why infrared? Infrared because if you think about it, you know, you got a black car, you go out in a sunny summer day uh, after your car has been parked out there, put your hand on the roof, it's hot, right? No question about it. A charcoal briquette in space uh, is going to get real hot and therefore infrared, it radiates in the infrared. So an infrared telescope, you don't look at reflected sunlight, you look at the radiated heat. And since space is very cold, that heat stands out against the, uh, against the blackness of space very well. And so what we're looking for is a more capable telescope. This is one of several, but in combination with some new telescopes that are coming in on the ground, we want to get up uh, a good infrared telescope in space. We're not going to go into a lot of detail, but that's the challenge of finding them. Well, when astronomers see them using telescopes, what do you do? Well, they report that data to what's called the Minor Planet Center, uh, which is the world's clearinghouse for all information on um, planetary bodies, things in the solar system, uh, including all the asteroids and comets, etc. But astronomers um, uh, view asteroids every night, thousands and thousands of observations discovering asteroids every night. Most of them that you see have been seen before, but every night we find new asteroids, most of them in the main belt, where, all, where the majority of them are, but the ones that come in past the Earth are also discovered every night, and they're reported on the web. Um, they're reported out to the JPL, uh, which is the NASA center down in Pasadena, California, and also to a similar operation over in Italy. So it's the United States and Italy who take the data that the astronomers get from their telescopes turn those into orbits and predict ahead 100 years to see whether each asteroid that we know about has any chance of hitting the Earth in the next 100 years. Uh, and that's what these people do. I think I've got, no, I didn't put the website there. Okay, so this is an example. This is the Sentry program of NASA, the Jet Propulsion Lab. And you can go on the web and get this. It's, uh, I don't have the URL up there, but if you just, uh, uh, remember NEO, Near Earth Object, and then do NEO, JPL, NASA, Gov, and uh, you'll get this. This stuff is all in the open literature. It's all published on the web every day. It's updated automatically, and we've discovered, we've got 12,000 uh, asteroids that we've discovered in about the last uh, 14 or 15 years, um, and that sounds like a lot, and it is, but we've got a lot more to go. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment, but let me just say that uh, of the asteroids that can do harm if they hit the Earth, um, there are about 10 million of them, okay? And we've discovered 12,000. Now, it doesn't take much of a mathematici mathematician to realize that since we're only discovering about 1,000 a year now, it's only going to take another 1,000 years before we've got them all inventory. Well, in fact, we only have one-tenth of them inventoried at that. Um, so what we need to do, and today, the 30th of June uh, 2015, is the first asteroid day, first annual asteroid day that's ever been held. And I've been all day, and many of you have been uh, partic participating in asteroid day. Uh, but what we've got to do is up our game, and we've got to up our game by getting the government's or the governments of the world, the governments and the space agencies of the world to, in fact, get an infrared telescope out of space as well as the uh, large synoptic space telescope that's going in down in Chile and starting up in 2022. And the combination of those things will up the game by about a factor of 100. So all of you should go on the web to asteroidday.org and sign the 100X asteroid declaration. Get with it, governments. Let's find these things. We can't protect life on the planet without knowing what's out there. That's the deal. Okay. So if you're not going to sign it, you can leave now. Okay. Civil, okay. So what do you do about it when you find it and you predict there's, a, there's an impact coming? 
Well, mitigation is comprised really of two things. Civil defense, if you're going to let it hit for a number of reasons, maybe it's a small one and it's cheaper to let it hit and evacuate or shelter in place than it is to try and deflect it. Or maybe you don't get the word early enough that it's going to hit and you don't have time to deflect it. So civil defense or you know duck and cover is one of mitigation techniques and the other if you have enough early warning and it's cost effective, whatever that may mean, uh, you go ahead and deflect it. And we have the technology available today to do that. So here you see a couple of orbits. This is the Earth's orbit and the Earth, let's say, a month before impact and three weeks before, two weeks before, and there's impact, or make that three weeks, two weeks, one week, and, and impact. There's the asteroid coming along in its orbit. Now I just want you to picture riding on that asteroid as you're headed for an impact with the Earth because you'll see that later on. So picture yourself on that asteroid running in toward the intersection. That's a three-dimensional intersection in space, the Earth's orbit and the asteroid's orbit. Okay, and then here's some deflection things, but again, we'll talk about that later. Okay, so civil defense, uh, everybody understands civil defense, uh, you know, duck and cover. Uh, uh, you can shelter in place or duck and cover and you can uh, you can evacuate the way we do for a hurricane um, and you know if we have a, a week of warning of a big impact coming and we know where it's going to hit then this is a kind of uh, scene which will ensue now you know hopefully we're going to practice for that but uh, hurricanes are not the most orderly things and they happen several times a year. So you can picture one that happens once every 500 years <laughs> is gonna be a, an interesting first go at it. Okay, so mitigation technology. So, uh, so let's talk about the other one. Uh, let's talk about if you have enough early warning, what do you do about it? Well, uh, there are existing, the thing that we've been interested in, and when I say we now, I'm talking about the B612 Foundation, by the way, B612 uh, is the name of the asteroid from which the little prince came to Earth. So that's why, very cute, right, that we named our foundation B612. Uh, that was before we quite got serious and then it was too late. Uh, you know, maybe some of you have first names of that type. Um, in, in any event, uh, so one thing you do is, is you run it, kinetic impact means just run into it. You know, we know how to send a spacecraft up and run into, in that case, a comet, uh, Temple One. Uh, we did that in 2005. And you know, we do rendezvous all the time. So we know how to go up into space with things and, and find or run into other things, meet up with other things. And if you want to change the speed of your car on the freeway, uh, somebody run into you from the back or somebody run into you from the front, and it's gonna change your speed, right? Well, that's, that's what a deflection is. What you wanna do for, to make an asteroid miss the Earth, uh, since it takes the Earth eight minutes to get through that intersection, is you wanna make the asteroid either a few minutes late or a few minutes early, so that either the Earth goes through the intersection before the asteroid does, or you can make the asteroid arrive early and get through the intersection before the Earth gets there. And that's all a deflection is. You're changing, changing the timing. And so to change the time, you change the speed of the asteroid. And what you do is brute force, just run into the sucker. It's not complicated. It is rocket science, however. <laughs> um, okay, now that is, as you might imagine, that's a brute, not only a brute force technique, but it's approximate. Who knows if you hit in a, in a soft spot or in a hard spot, or maybe you hit it a glancing blow or whatever. So you don't want an approximate change in the velocity of the asteroid. You want a precise change. And so the way you trim it up is you pull up next to it. This, you have an observer spacecraft up there that watches that to make sure it happens right. But then it pulls in and you just hover next to the asteroid and your mutual gravity between you and the asteroid is a gravitational tow rope and if you stay there, you'll gradually pull the asteroid toward you. You make a very small, slow, precise change in the big change of velocity that the initial impact gave it. But if you don't have time for this and you need about 10 years of advance warning to get this one, two hit done, 
If you can't do that, then there's always the big dog. And uh, so a nuclear explosion, this is an actual uh, asteroid called Itakawa. And just to give you an idea of its actual size, there's the Roman Colosseum. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, those are what we refer to as existing available technologies in case something happens now. We know how to do this, but NASA, nor no, one, no other space agency, has yet demonstrated these techniques. We need, well, with the exception of that one. We don't want to demonstrate the nuclear option in space, but that, that option should be demonstrated, and one of the things that we'd like you to help us do is push on the federal government to get that job done. Okay, now we're gonna to go to the third one, which I said is the most challenging and also the most mysterious. You know, why in the world is this a geopolitical issue? Well, okay, put yourself back on an asteroid headed for the intersection and you're looking at the Earth, right? That's what you see. Well, you're in the plane, your asteroid, the plane that you're in, in your orbit around the sun as an asteroid has to intersect the Earth or else you're not gonna hit it. Well, there's the intersection of, oops, let me hit it again. There's the intersection of your plane that you're in with the Earth. And more than that, if you're going to hit the Earth, you're going to hit the Earth somewhere along that red line. If you get through the intersection before the Earth gets there, you're gonna be out here somewhere, okay? Because the Earth is going from left to right. And if, you, if the Earth gets through the intersection before you, well, you're gonna pass over here. But if you're during that eight minute period when the leading edge to the trailing edge is going through the three dimensional intersection, then you're gonna hit somewhere on that red line. Well, let's just say you're gonna hit there, just for an example, okay? Now, when you are going to deflect the asteroid, you're gonna make it arrive a little earlier or a little later until it misses the Earth. But after you deflect a little bit, maybe you only change its arrival time by two minutes, you make it arrive two minutes earlier, well, it's not gonna miss the Earth, it's gonna hit there now, or four minutes earlier, and it's gonna hit the Earth there. So what you wanna do is you wanna make it arrive like eight minutes early, and the job is done. You've gotten through the intersection, you know, 10 years later, before the Earth got there. But on the other hand, you know, you can make it arrive two minutes late, four minutes late, and if you're successful, eight minutes late. Okay, suppose you're not successful. Okay, if you get it two minutes early, wow, it's gonna hit there and make a hell of a tsunami and wipe out a bunch of people on the coastline, or it's gonna hit over there and, you know, what's that, Germany or, or uh, Poland or somewhere, or maybe out in Russia. Uh, they're not gonna like that. So which way do you think these people want you to move the asteroid, <laughs> right? And which way do you think people in the United States want you to move the asteroid? Well, what do we do? Do we race the Russians and the Europeans up to the asteroid to push it in the other way? <laughs> no, you, it, obviously this has to be coordinated. You know, there's gotta be some agreement. And if you have, picture, you know, the president of France coming up on an election and he's gonna have He's going to give an okay so that it gets deflected this way? Think about that for a minute. This is a hell of a geopolitical problem. How do you get the world to agree what you do with this? Or do you do anything at all? Do you just let it hit there and let there be a tsunami and good luck for the people on the different coasts? So this is why this is a geopolitical problem and why we took it to the United Nations. So obviously if something goes wrong, those are bad results, and what you want is a good result. You're gonna drag the impact point off the Earth along that risk corridor until it's safely off the Earth and everybody is safe. But in the interim, the only way you can make everybody safe is to temporarily put at risk people along that risk corridor on one side or the other. That is one hellacious geopolitical decision. To do it, the Association of Space Explorers, our professional organization of astronauts and cosmonauts, which I founded back in the, in, in the mid 80s, uh, we got together and said, look, we're a good organization to bring this to the world leaders uh, of nations, of all the nations in the world, 
to say, look, this is a serious issue, and you guys have got to be ready to make this kind of a timely decision, or a lot of people might die. So we brought it, we, we got an expert group together, we wrote a report, and in 2009, we presented that to the United Nations. This is my, the back of my head, okay, uh, presenting in Vienna to the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or affectionately known as the Outer Space Committee of the United Nations. Um, this was when we brought it to the, this is the president of the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations uh, back in 2009. Uh, we presented it to the General Assembly, uh, some meetings over there, and this was when a bunch of uh, we astronauts and cosmonauts got together in New York uh, when it got to the General Assembly to help advertise it. Um, and out of that have come a couple of organizations that the United Nations is now, uh, what, what we did was we really enabled the United, and helped the United Nations to build a skeleton decision-making process. The General Assembly kicked it back down to the Outer Space Committee to, to put muscle and bone, and, uh, or muscle and, and uh, meat on, on those uh, skeletal bones. And so these organizations have now been formed or are in the process of forming and dealing with some of the geopolitical challenges. So that's the, uh, that's the game that's going on in planetary defense. Most people say, why in the world are you dealing with the United Nations of all the organizations in the world? What a pain in the ass. Uh, yeah, but down below, all hat and no cattle, but my God, what a hat. You know, it's frustrating, it's a pain in the butt working with the United Nations, but when the United Nations decides something, the whole world has made a decision. And it's the only organization that represents basically everybody in the world. So that's, uh, that's where the geopolitical part of planetary defense lies. And uh, that's it. Um, I hope you enjoy the film. You'll see all different dimensions of what we're dealing with here uh, as you go into the film. And uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And the panel uh, will, uh, people who are here, you'll see a lot of them in the film as well. So have a good time. I've got another engagement, but uh, I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks very much. <laughs>